Hey everyone, good morning. Um, I'm Jen Fishburn. Welcome back to Preterism Changes Everything. Hope you guys had a great weekend and uh, we're ready to get back into the story. Now, um, I was talking with someone about the serpent and we were kind of going back and forth on what was the serpent really. And I think that um, we kind of agreed that a better term might be viper. And that just kind of uh, tells me a little bit more that the serpent was um, one that was dangerous. It wasn't just your typical garden snake, um, even though we think of this Garden of Eden as being, um, you know, just a garden like what we see today. I don't think so because there's all the animals were there. But, um, but I think in my mind, it's more of a viper. And that's because uh, we look at the way that the vipers are today. They are the ones that are able to be charmed. They're also the ones that are going to uh, strike um, and bite. Um, it's not a big deal, but I was just thinking, well, viper maybe. And then when we look at brood of vipers in the New Testament, when Jesus talks to them, well, to me, that connection just seems to make more sense. So uh, maybe, maybe not. But if that helps you, uh, I hope uh, it helps somebody. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on to the next part of Jehovah's response. This time it's to the woman, to Eve. And so this is in Genesis 3.16. And to the woman he said, I will multiply, multiply your pain and your conception. In pain you shall give birth to children. Your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. So many will say that this is a curse. But notice that the word curse is not used here. Uh, like it is with the serpent. And we're going to see that it is used um, in the one with Adam. So I tend to think this, that this is more of a natural consequence for Eve than a curse. Um, a curse is a lot stronger than a natural consequence. Um, and, and a curse is almost like, um, it, it's like, I'm going to bring evil on you because you're such a bad person. Whereas a natural consequence is more like, well, since you did this, this is what happens to that. And that's kind of how I look at it. Um, so again, there are three aspects to this, uh, these um, consequences for Eve. Uh, the first one is pain, then being a mother and being a wife. So let's look at them. So the word uh, for multiply is raba, and that's used again twice in here. And you'll see that I said, I will multiply, multiply your pain. And so I'm just going to try and I'll use it that way uh, in the way it's that we see it in scripture just so that we can get an idea of how they used it. Um, so that's just their, again, their emphasis. That's like bolding it. It's like really, really strong emphasis. I will greatly multiply. That's a really good translation. It just, the words don't actually say greatly multiply, but it's a good translation. All right. So if, um, if something is multiplied, that means that there must have been something there to begin with, right? Because you can't multiply zero. You can't multiply nothing. So if there was no pain in childbirth to begin with and you multiplied it, it doesn't matter. There's still no pain. So that means to me that um, there had to have been pain in childbirth. Now, whether there were babies already born or whether there, the pain in childbirth was already intended as part of the process, um, it doesn't matter. But it's going to be much, much, much worse now. That is really what this is saying. So some people say that um, giving birth is the greatest pain that a human can endure. And um, so now did this pass on to all women or was this just for Eve? Well, we really don't know <laughs> because we don't know if Eve's labor pains were worse than those we experience today or not. So um, I'm going to say it was probably some of both, but we, do, we, don't, we can't really tell. We can't really tell, I don't think. Um, now, when Jehovah was first giving a few commandments to Adam and Eve, he told them to be fruitful and multiply. Um, and since we don't know how much time passed between that commandment and the first sin, we don't know if they missed opportunities to make babies or not. So what is interesting to consider here is that Jehovah always gives natural consequences according to the sin. So if Eve just ate a piece of fruit, why would her punishment have anything to do with having babies? Um, would it just be more reasonable that she would not be able to eat certain fruits or she would lose her sense of taste or something related to her sin? Um, 
why are the first two aspects of this consequence related specifically to having babies? She's going to have a whole lot more pain when she has babies now, and she's going to have a lot of babies. So both the pain and the number of babies were going to be increased there. In fact, the way it is worded, it could also mean that she could have more miscarriages and that her children would cause her pain as well, which is clearly what we see when Cain murders Abel, right? And this is kind of what I mean about layers, seeing layers. So we see, even though it's two aspects, the pain and the childbirth, we see layers even within that. So if the consequences should match the sin, that's the law of sowing and reaping that we see um, in, in the New Testament, right? And the consequences are about having more pain pertaining to children and having more children, wouldn't it be more likely that her sin was pertaining to making babies as well? Now, I'm not going to teach that whole doctrine because it's way too controversial, but there are so many questions I have regarding this whole story that just don't line up with eating a piece of fruit. So let's go on though. Um, so let's look at the word for desire. In the Hebrew, it's uh, teshukwa, which it has kind of a, a double connotation here. It's both a sexual longing and an emotional longing, a desire for her husband, basically in every way. Um, but he is going to rule over her. Now the word for rule there is mashal, and it is the same word as uh, have dominion when they had dominion over the animals. They ruled over the animals. So it is the exact same word. So uh, that's, kind of, um, that's kind of serious, right? So the third consequence then was pertaining to her role, Eve's role as a wife. Now it was Adam's job to tell her that what Jehovah had originally told him before she was created out of his rib, right? So Jewish tradition teaches that, well, Jehovah told Adam not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that Adam told Eve not even to touch it. And so Adam was the first one to add to God's commandments in the exact same way that the Pharisees did in Jesus' day, which is actually another connection between these two stories, another layer. I think that's cool. So Eve was created to be Adam's helper, to be his strength, to help him to do well in life. Now, I was watching Steve Harvey recently, and, um, and he had six guests, three men and three women, on his show, and they all agreed that the woman's role, or part of the woman's role, is to make the man a better man. That a good woman will make a man into a better man. And so I do believe that this is a universal principle. But rather than strengthening Adam here, Eve chose to bring Adam into her bad decision, and she brought him down instead. So the natural consequence for this was that Eve would lose her position of influence over her husband. Although she would still greatly love and desire him, but now he would rule over her in the same way that he had dominion over the animals. Eve was created to play a high role in her relationship with Adam. But the natural consequences were, was down that she was lowered almost to the status of that of an animal. And from then on, in Jewish cultures and many others, women became nothing more than a piece of property just like cattle and sheep. Now Paul writes in his first letter to Timothy, Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So in reality, Eve sinned first, and then she persuaded Adam to join her. Uh, women still have that level of power over men today. Um, as far as being, being able to persuade them to do all these kinds of things, from what I hear. Um, but we don't usually, or at least women, I don't think usually understand that. I don't anyway. Um, I know it intellectually, but I just, I don't understand how that power is. I know that there, men don't understand everything about women, and likewise women don't understand everything about men. But God did create us with these different aspects. And um, I think we can clearly see that in the story of Adam and Eve. Um, and we even see that this was the, uh, the first uh, instance of a communication problem, right, between men and, and women. When Adam tells Eve, hey, don't even touch that tree. And, and the serpent says to Eve, hey, did God say you can't touch it? And Eve's like, well, 
I don't know. It's like, and the, and the serpent's like, no, 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 no. So that was a communication problem going on there. So we can see nothing is new under the sun. All right, now, uh, so what was really going on here? I think John describes it well in his first letter. He says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away with all, along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now we're gonna get into the context of that passage much, much later, but there are three things here that seem to be related to the, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the lust or the desire of the flesh, uh, which is the body, or the lust or the desire of the eyes, and pride. So these three aspects of life face us every day in this world, and we can choose whether we feed those desires and experience the natural consequence of doing so, or whether we choose good or righteousness, or what the Father has told us is best for us. So there's an overarching principle in this story that plays out in every single person's life, nearly every day of our life. Every day, we are Eve. Whether you're male or female, it doesn't matter. Every day, we have tons of choices before us. Some of those choices are literally good food versus bad food. And we experience either sickness or health, depending on what we choose. We also live in an age where there is constant entertainment all around us. Whether it is the TV or movies, social media, music, YouTube, all kinds of stuff. What do you feed your eyes? What you feed your eyes affects your mind and your heart. And the more you feed it, the more it grows. It is your choice what you feast your eyes on. I know there are literally millions of examples for this one, but I had a roommate once that became addicted to the reenactments of those uh, real murders on those TV shows. And I watched him become so fascinated by these unsolved murders that he once told me that he had planned how to murder me so that no one would ever find my body or know what happened. And so I got out of there fast. It was no joke. So these things really, really do affect us in, in, in so, so, so many ways. It's so important. The third area is pride. We all wrestle with ego. ego. Some people think they are somehow better than other people, while others struggle with thinking they are not as good as others. And both positions are wrong, and it's going to cause many, many problems in life. So as we look at these details in these stories, it's good to know the original intent, the original story, the details there. But if we don't learn anything from it, then it's just an intellectual ex exercise. So do you want to be like Eve and have to experience it for yourself? To know that the principles God laid out for all mankind are true? Most of us do, don't we? But once we mess up, we don't have to continue learning every lesson the hard way. I remember the day, I'll never forget, <laughs> the day my son came to me and he was 14 years old and he said, Mom, I know you've taught me right from wrong. He said, but I have to experience it for myself in order to know if what you say is true. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to do the opposite of everything that you told me to do. And uh, that about killed me. <laughs> and he did. Um, and seven years later, he came back to me, he was 21, and he said, Mom, you were right, and now I've messed up my life. So we don't have to experience things for ourselves like Eve did, or like Adam did, <laughs> in order to know that what God says is best for us is really best for us. So let's make our choices today to control what we feed our flesh, what we look at, and fill our minds with, and don't compare ourselves to anyone else. God's principles are always best. Hope you guys have a great day, and tomorrow we'll be talking about what happened to Adam. <laughs>